With this lesson, we're going to be looking at ancient Greece and the Aegean Islands. With the study of Greece, we begin a new phase in our study of art. Up to now, we've looked at work that was in some ways not as familiar to our understanding, so we've had to use our imaginations to imagine how the people lived that created this art. But once we begin to get into Greece, that changes. The influence of the ancient Greeks are so pervasive that often we don't even notice them. For example, most of the downtown architecture includes buildings that reflect Greek influence. And the same is true of the government that's housed within these buildings. Now in this class we discuss art, we analyze it from our, the basis of our own cultural conditioning, whatever that may be. But this is limited. Because Greek culture is so much more like Western society, it is better if we just pause for a minute before we look at it and consider the times in which the Greeks lived. In most people's understanding, there's civilization and then there is culture, and the two are distinct from each other. Civilization means our practical and social way of life, the sort of nuts and bolts of how life works, while culture is in intellectual and artistic expression. Artists and intellectuals tend to be on the fringes of our society today, at least in Western culture. And some of you might have thought about this when you reflected upon what you were going to choose for your major. This split between art and everyday life is actually very recent in the history of humanity. It's occurred gradually over the last couple of hundred years. And yet, nowadays, we just accept that as fact. You know, art, well, art's not really that necessary, according to some. That's actually not my belief, but there you go. Now, the Greeks held a different view. In Greek society, artists and intellectuals were central. They believed that humans on Earth are capable of achieving an idealized state of being, and this was expressed in their art. Unlike the Egyptians, the Greeks believed in the power of individual expression. They believed that each person has a unique voice, and by pursuing their own personal best, each person could create innovation and thus further society overall. This belief resulted in an explosion of creative and scientific pursuits, and this came to its culmination over a period of about 150 years. This is called the Golden Age of Greece, and it was around 400 BC. During this brief time span, the foundation was laid for the standards of art and beauty that we, who are in Western society, still consider true today. Now, it's interesting to note that when the Renaissance came along, oh, about 15, 1600 years later, the same thing occurred, where there was this return to Greek thought, and they had, again, the celebration of the individual for creative expression. But first things first, let's look at the art of the Aegean cultures. So the roots of ancient Greece actually go back to a group of small islands off the coast of mainland Greece known as the Aegeans. These islands, beginning about 3000 BC, were the home of a very sophisticated culture, with the largest of these islands being Crete. There was also a group of islands called the Cyclades scattered around it, and on mainland Greece, there was a more warlike culture known as the Mycenaean. The Aegean people were peaceful. They were herders and farmers, and because they lived so close to the sea, they had an active trade across all cultures. They exported bronze and armor and tools to Egypt and to the Persian Empire. These islanders built vast palace complexes that show a clear Persian influence except in this moderate climate, they were more open, with lower ceilings and these elaborate, brightly painted decorations, probably reflecting their temperate and easy way of life. While we're not going to look at each of the different island cultures um, and memorize the islands, uh, it is useful to use your imagination to picture in the mind's eye how they must have lived. Now, one of the, these islands was known as Thera, and it's believed by some to be home of all the myths about the lost civilization of Atlantis. In ancient times, this island nourished a very advanced culture. And then, around 1800 BC, there was a large volcanic eruption, and more than half of the island went into the sea. 
Since the people of the Aegeans, though, left no written record, they were prehistoric, we are left to look at what they did leave behind and really to create our own story. Let's look a little bit of, at the art. These are all from the Cyclades. Now to the right are two examples of female figurines that were found in great numbers all over the islands. They range in size from a few inches high to over five feet high and they were probably very elaborately painted when they had uh, when they were just made with facial features, hair, and ornaments. Now above to the left is one of my one of my favorites but honestly I have so many favorites. This is called the harp player. The reason that this piece to me is spectacular is because it's a very simple composition and it's very graceful and yet we can really tell that this harp player has kind of got his head leaned back and is enjoying the music even though he's lost his hands in the thousands of years since he was created. Now another thing that's really lovely to notice about this sculpture is that it is in the round so you can look at it from all sides. Also note the artist's use of negative space of the air that's not sculpted. For example, the center of the harp, the area at the bottom of the chair. These shapes are just as important to the sculpture as the sculpture itself. Now, the one in the middle is by the artist Madagliani, and it reflects the influences of the early work. He was a, he was a real fan of the cyclic, cycladic art and the art of the Aegean Islands, and this is reflected in his work. Let's talk about the palace at Gnosis. I find this fascinating. Of course, most of it is fascinating, actually. But they did. The Aegean Islanders, in general, built grand palace complexes. And this one is the most famous, on the island of Crete. It's a six-acre complex that had paved streets, water systems, even sewers with terracotta pipes that ran under the palace floors. It was rebuilt after an earthquake around 1700 BC and then it became a rich trading center. When archaeologists explored the site they found enough storage jars to hold 20,000 gallons of olive oil. This vast palace was protected by this complex layout. In fact the word labyrinth it means maze in our common speech today but it comes from an ancient name for this city and originally what it meant was crossed battle axes. Hey, this is on the quiz. The term labyrinth means crossed battle axes in its original use. And then it came to mean a sort of a confusing maze. Because within this palace structure, there was all sorts of hidden hallways, passageways, stairways that led to nowhere. And if you did not know your, net, your way around it, you would be lost. So it was a good way that the people at Gnosis had of protecting themselves. Now the bull riton up there on the left um, is a ceremonial piece and it's just a very important piece from this time. You would pour liquid in the top and it would come out through the nostrils and mouth of the beer, of the moss of the uh, bull. Uh, to the left we see uh, some examples of the decoration that we see at these great palace complexes. This is the restored queen's throne room from Gnosis and it gives us an idea of what the palace must have been like. There was a man named Lord Elgin and he, he's a very controversial figure actually in archaeology. He was working around 1900 and he made it his life's work to restore this palace to its original splendor. Now the archaeologists some don't think this is so great because he went back and he repainted and he fixed part of what was there according to his vision of what it must have looked like. Now this would never happen today, but because he was inspired to do this, here we have a taste of the palace's original splendor, and it's easier for us to imagine what it must have looked like. This is a drawing of a palace from the mainland, around 1300 BC, and it shows how the people of this time decorated every possible surface with these geometric, colorful, and stylized drawings. And looking at this, it's easy to imagine the sea breeze blowing through, blowing through the open walls and an easy, abundant life. 
although in truth, on the mainland, they had a little bit more of a scrappier existence than did those Aegeans that were living on this sea, out in the sea on the islands. So here we have corbelled vaults. The Mycenaean people were very different than the other Aegean cultures, and they're the people who lived on the mainland of Greece. Because they had limited trade, they were much more isolated, and their palaces were surrounded by thick walls and protected gates. Above, to the right, is a treasury, and to the left is a part of a wall's protected structure. Both examples were built around 1300 BC. Now what is most extraordinary about these structures is their use of something called a corbelled vault. In, this, in the case of a corbelled vault, which you'll need to remember, the stones are placed without mortar. Each is kept in place by the weight of the other stones. But check out these, sculpt, these structures. See how they kind of um, they move inward? So I'm, I just find myself amazed at how did they actually do that? Now, the Mycenaeans, they were kind of a warlike people. And the Aegeans, were, the Aegean Islanders, were a more peaceful people. And as their societies sort of faded away, then we had the resurgence or the coming into the fore of the peoples of ancient Greece. And that's what we'll look at next. Thanks for listening. That's all.